uh, we're going to um, go, I think, straight into our next session. So that's going to be Professor Judy Wiseman in conversation with Dame Stephanie Shirley. Judy is Professor of Sociology at the London School of Economics and a Turing Institute Fellow who has published widely in the fields of science and technology studies, feminist theory, work and organisations, and is probably best known for their analysis of the gendered nature of technology. Dame Stephanie has a rich biography which spans pioneering work in the IT industry, philanthropy, entrepreneurship and women in business, diversity, overcoming adversity and managing change. So she's going to have a lot to get her teeth stuck into. So Judy, the floor is yours. Um, right, so can you hear me? Yes? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay, well, welcome everyone to this conversation with Dame Stephanie Shirley. Um, it's, it's just a complete honour and a delight to um, have been uh, given the, the opportunity um, to have this conversation, actually. Um, as was just said, um, Dame Shirley is a pioneer in the computer industry, a champion of women and work and business, um, indeed a feminist role model for me and for um, many, many people, and is also a leading um, philanthropist. And my name is Judy Wiseman, and I lead the Women in Data Science and AI um, project at the Alan Turing Institute. We're part of the public policy program. And our work is really addressing the lack of diversity in the AI industry, but also importantly, making links between that and um, the social biases that we're increasingly recognized um, as being embedded in a lot of artificial intelligence systems. We're going to start today uh, with Dame, um, Stephanie speaking for about 10 minutes with some um, reflections relevant to the themes of this conference, and then we'll come back and have a conversation for the rest of the time, which I'm really looking forward to, and I've got masses I want to discuss, so I don't know how I'm going to get through, um, through half of it, actually. Um, so over to you, Dame Stephanie. I reckon to be the oldest person here by some considerable margin. Age brings few benefits, but one is perspective. I've seen a lot in my time. I can look back and I can also look forward with the benefit of experience. But beware, the older I get, the better I used to be. When Mozart was my age, he'd already been dead for 50 years. I can't claim to have been a pioneer of computing like Alan Turing, but I was a pioneer of the computing industry. My fascination with computers dates back to 1954, the year Turing died. I was then a lowly scientific assistant at the post office research station at Dollis Hill. Um, it sounds rather humdrum to modern ears, but at that time it was at the cutting edge of technological development. One summer, I spent my annual leave working unpaid at a rival research station run by the General Electric Company, where they were developing an early computer called the HEC-4. HEC-4 was a huge multi-part machine that, to the modern eye, would look more like a fitted kitchen than a forerunner of the personal computer. But I sensed it had in immense potential if properly programmed. And in this, I was unconsciously echoing Turing, who first established the concept of the computer as a universal mach machine capable of tackling any task. In due course, I struck out on my own, founding a computer programming company, which with great imagination, I called freelance programmers. And eventually I became one of Britain's wealthiest women before becoming a venture philanthropist dedicated to learning to give money away wisely. Back in 1950, 
Turing famously said, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty that needs to be done. Today, we may perhaps be able to see further. We have a better idea of what the enormous field he helped to found may be capable of, but unquestionably, there is still much to be done. Artificial intelligence was a theoretical concept when Turing first articulated his famous Turing test, a test of whether a machine could fool a human into thinking it was itself human. And AI today has entered the mainstream. Uh, it has applications in fields as diverse as health and data science, the military and gaming, autonomous vehicles, and social media. Now, over these two days, we all have the chance to learn more about AI and its applications, but also to stand back and take stock. What stage have we reached in the development of artificial intelligence? Where may it go next? What are the opportunities and what the potential pitfalls? And perhaps we may want to compare our approach with the way we tackled similar opportunities and pitfalls in the past. The conference programme is, of course, focused on topical issues. Uh, Britain's AI strategy is set out by the government last September. The impact of the pandemic and of climate change. But we must not lose sight of the wider issues, some of which pose important legal, ethical, and social questions. Is AI fulfilling its promise to increase efficiency and change the world? If so, is it also raising the specter of mass unemployment as human input is increasingly rendered redundant? Have we outsourced too much decision-making to machines, allowing them to dictate the way we live our lives, the information we consume in ways that may not be entirely healthy? The power of artificial intelligence is certainly growing exponentially, and there is no finish line. It's exciting, but we must not let our excitement cloud our judgment. Interest in these questions goes back to the very earliest days of computing, and uh, Turing was the first to pose some of them. He laid many of the foundations of today's technology-driven world. Friends, colleagues, teachers described him often in tones of wonderment and awe as a genius. He reputedly had an IQ of 185. He was mathematician, computer scientist, logician, cryptographer, philosopher, as well as a theor theoretical biologist. So a genuine polymath. Mm -hmm. Like many geniuses, he was focused on ideas, whether obviously useful or not. Uh, in his case, he also had a strong interest in applying those ideas in practical innovation. Geniuses are reputed to be highly adaptable, insatiably curious and open-minded, mm. as well as in many cases as being mildly eccentric. They know what they don't know. They have a high degree of self-control and often they like their own company. Turing exhibited all these characteristics, though two others often associated with genius, being funny and being sensitive to other people's experiences, he very definitely did not have. But he did have a grasp, uh, intellectually, if not intuitively, of the importance of empathy. What is the Turing test after all? if not a test of a machine's capacity for empathy, 
of being able to put itself into the mind of a human being. Though he was comfortable with his own company, Turing also valued teamwork, especially in the code breaking for which he's mainly remembered today, breaking the Nazi Enigma code, so giving the Allies an edge in World War II and leading to the modern computer. I'm currently sponsoring a project at the National Museum of Computing at Bletchley Park. Turing worked with Gordon Welshman, the head of Hut 6 at Bletchley Park. Mm -hmm. That hut is still there and it's still just a hut. AI is intelligence demonstrated by machines as opposed to the natural intelligence of animals, including humans. The question of whether the computer is capable, not just of calculation, but of thought, of thinking like a human being, was first asked by Turing. And even today, there is no obvious route to creating machines that can participate in human culture sufficiently deeply to pass the Turing test. We don't know yet whether we will ever be able to build robots that are perceptually indistinguishable from humans, sentient machines that think and behave like a human being. Is our own intelligence unique, impossible to replicate? Or are we just machines of a different kind? Could everything that we know or do be replaced by a mega computer programmed to drive a sufficiently complicated robot? As machines have become more capable, the nature of the Turing test has also changed. In 1950, the question was, can a computer convince a human being that it's not a computer, but a real person? Now, the question is often reversed. Can a human being convince a computer that he or she is a real person, not a computer? Shades of the number of times online, I'm asked to affirm, I am not a robot. Sadly, Turing is also remembered for his presumed suicide following chemical castration to cure his homosexuality by hormone injection. Today, we recoil in horror at his treatment. Although he received a royal pardon in 2013, let me remind you that 69 out of the 195 countries of the world still consider homosexuality a criminal offence. It's vital to remember and to cherish the lives of people who are different, who are marginalized by society, which may sometimes include the highly gifted. The failure to develop the, talented, the talents of gifted children deprives us of future innovators, creative thinkers, leaders, and outstanding performers. As Turing himself said, sometimes it is the people no one can imagine anything of who do the things no one can imagine. As a businesswoman, I can understand the potential of AI for companies and entrepreneurs of all kinds. It offers an immense competitive advantage. It can help us build more efficient and productive organizations and contribute to our bottom line. But there's more than one bottom line. There's the financial bottom line, which can be measured by improvements in productivity. But there's also a social bottom line. And here, as I've suggested, it's not always clear that AI delivers only benefits. 
And there's a third bottom line measured by the environmental impact of an organization. And here too, the jury is still out uh, with the tremendous demands AI can sometimes make for energy and computing power. As always in business, we should be focused on the bottom line, but of all three kinds, financial, social, and environmental. If Turing were alive today, he would of course be astonished the way his brain child has developed. Uh, perhaps he would be proud, but he might also sound a note of caution. He might recall the classic story of Pygmalion, the misogynist sculptor who fell in love with the statue he had carved, which helpfully turned into a woman when he kissed it. We are like Pygmalion, embracing the artificial intelligence we've molded. In the original narrative, Pygmalion and his statue apparently lived happily together. But in the early 20th century, George Bernard Shaw updated the story. In his play, Pygmalion, the statue became a cockney flower girl. The sculptor, a privileged professor of phonetics, who sets out to make a new woman of her by teaching her to speak proper. He succeeds only to discover that his creation has assumed a life of her own and is far from the biddable creature he had imagined. Shaw's Professor Higgins learned a valuable lesson. And perhaps one moral of the story is that the more we seek to develop machines that can think like us, the more we learn about ourselves. Thank you very much uh, for that very inspiring talk. I must say, listening to you describe um, Turing as a polymath and having in incredible sort of qualities of, um, in, you know, being insatiably curious and open-minded and highly adaptable actually are very appropriate um, qualities to uh, begin this conversation um, with because you've done so many things in your life, life and um, there are so many aspects of it I want to sort of uh, talk to you about. But I mean, because of my own interests, um, I've been following your work for decades and decades and decades. You don't know this, but uh, when I was a graduate student in Cambridge, actually, in the 70s, I remember reading about F International, this amazing um, software company that you established in 1962, and um, you know the opportunities it was giving women programmers. So I wondered if we could just uh, start with you telling us how that amazing project emerged, because you know it's at a time when there's very few women in IT, let alone taking on uh, leading positions. And you set up this incredible radical business model um, at the time. And as I say, I, I remember reading about it because it was like this sort of pioneering iconic company that young feminists like me who were interested in gender and technology were, you know, really wanted to know about and actually my you know one of my great regrets in my life is that I was too shy to get in touch with you then in my 20s. I wish you had. I know and um, interview you so perhaps you could tell the audience a little about you know how that started. Women in the 50s and 60s were um, really second-class citizens. Um, we were disbarred from most financial transactions um, certain activities were forbidden to us. We couldn't work on the stock exchange. We couldn't drive a bus or fly an aeroplane. Um, we couldn't open a, a, I couldn't even open the company's bank account without getting my husband's authorization. And that, to be honest, made me rather sort of irritable. Um, I felt that um, I had been patronized as a child uh, because I came to this country as a Jewish refugee. Um, I'd been patronized as a woman, and now um, this didn't seem to be getting any better. And so I'd set up my business not to make money, which is what most motivates most people, but very much as a social business uh, to 
um, really uh, set up a, a, an environment uh, in which I and women like me uh, would want to work. And whenever you survey women, what, what do we want from our work environment? Um, two things always come out, and that is um, uh, flexibility and work-life balance. Um, and we offered flexibility in the extreme and work-life balance with home working. We were the pioneers of home working. Um, and um, we had quite a, uh, it was a tough time to start because people didn't take us very seriously. And so we made tremendous efforts to always be very professional, um, to make sure that the quality of our work um, re remained at a high level, um, irrespective of babies and other calls on our time and, and, and energies. Um, to me, it was a very vital time. I felt the 60s were, uh, I was in tune with the 60s, with the vitality of it. I was inspired somewhat by the uh, Black Power movement um, in the States, which I only read about, I never took an active part, um, but I began to think, you know, there are better ways of running the world than having a two-tier social structure. No, absolutely. But I mean, I've read that you actually used to um, bid for projects on your kitchen table, you know, that your workplace was, you know, you were literally um, putting forward for these amazing projects for your table. And I guess I sort of think, you know, what confidence you must have had to set up something so radical. And I mean, I've read, as you mentioned, uh, that you were on the kinder transport and, and you've talked about how that experience really has kind of shaped your attitude to business and life. And I wondered if you could say a little um, about that for us. I think it was the Jesuits who sort of said, give me a child until they're seven. Uh, in my case, it, I was five when uh, I was put on a kinder transport train and shipped out to a new family, new country, new language, new food, new everything. Um, and that difficult though it was, and it, it was horrendous, really, and it was quite traumatic. Um, it has given me enormous power lifelong because I realised that um, I had dealt with that change. And yes, I, nothing else is, much, is going to phase me. Um, and I actually quite enjoy change. I like things to, to do things because they're new, and that's not a, a very good reason for doing them, but I, I'm always attracted to the new. Um, and that is powerful um, attitude uh, in the digital world. I also found that my life having been saved from Nazis, um, I learned really far too early in my life, at six, seven, um, that I needed to make mine a life that was worth saving. And so I don't fritter my time away. I try to fill each day with meaningful activity. Um, and um, in, in my later years, I work entirely philanthropically. Yes, and I mean, you, you've talked about, and, and um, you know, in, in your new book, so to speak, that I want to come back to, you, you speak a lot about the um, discrimination uh, women in business experienced at that time and you personally experienced. And I gather you took on the name um, Steve um, in order to deal with that. Perhaps you could tell people about that. Judy, I was writing uh, promotional letters, uh, introducing my company's services to potential um, clients. And um, this was in the days of letters before the days of email. And I was pouring these out at about 12 a week, something like that. Um, and basically receiving no reply whatsoever. And um, my late husband uh, suggested that I use the family nickname of Steve rather than Stephanie. Um, and um, so instead of having this double feminine, Stephanie Shirley, oh, I was yes. Steve Shirley. <laughs> Um, and people began to answer my letters and I began to get meetings. I had a good story to tell. So the work began to come in. So it was quite important in giving this mm -hmm. uh, facade just to get over the threshold. Right, yes. And I just wanted to last, lastly, uh, in terms of thinking about women and computing, ask you what, if you had any reflections on sort of 
the current situation. I mean, there's a lot happening in the area of women in STEM. You know, the government uh, have put, um, I read, 23 million uh, into schemes and, and produced 2,000 scholarships for master's conversion courses. And uh, the figures in terms of diversity are, are terrifically good in terms of these scholarships. Apparently, three quarters of these scholarships went to women and nearly half to black students. And, you know, there's a lot of great progress in, in, in many ways. But I have to say that we found uh, in our project that sort of translating the education and training into high level jobs in the industry is still quite uh, a problem. And that if you look at the figures of the number of women in data science, it's still only around sort of 20% in Britain and even fewer um, in machine learning. And, you know, what really strikes me is that we're often told that this is a pipeline problem. You know, those of us who've been around for decades know that, you know, this pipeline problem, you know, it, it's not a pipeline problem in that you get new fields. I mean, if you think about data science and machine learning, there are rather new fields, and yet we have a replication of these problems of a lack of diversity. And so I wondered what you thought about that in the current um, climate, if you think this is to, to do with sort of archaic workplace cultures, or if there are other reasons really that we're still having this conversation in a way, you know, why are we still having this conversation in the 21st century about, um, you know, women in computing? Well, I try and cheer myself up by sort of thinking of some of the figures that you've quoted, um, which really show that there is an improvement. Yeah. There is, yes, there are more people coming out, there are more people entering the field. Um, but inside, I cringe because many of the questions being debated and discussed were there 50 years ago, and you would have thought they would have disappeared by now. The um, main change, I think, is that I was battling against legal barriers. Um, the inability mm -hmm. to, to do certain jobs and, and you know, you, you were not supposed to work on the night shift. I remember breaking that rule many, many times. Um, the rules that were, 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 were designed in an age where w women were very much considered um, the weaker sex and was done with, with some feeling of, 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 of generosity. Uh, today, uh, women are battling against cultural issues. Uh, the culture of an organization where um, women's views are not um, valued, the, their views are sometimes not listened to, or if they're listened to, they're not heard. Um, and those cultural issues are going to take a lot more than, than a few billion. Um, and of course, it sounds a big number, but when you think of the potential of the industry, it's not really um, important in national terms. Great, thank you. I mean, we haven't got very much time left, so I absolutely want to move on to, to the amazing charity work you've been doing over the last uh, three decades, actually, um, on autism and, and IT. And I was very struck, I read your wonderful um, lunch in the Financial Times a few weeks ago, where you describe yourself, which I thought was a wonderful term, as a venture philanthropist. I thought that was, you know, terrific. And I just wondered um, if you could tell us about your sort of charities and, and the work you've been doing there. And, and I guess, particularly for this audience, how your experience in computing has kind of fed into that uh, work on autism. Well, I concentrate on things that I know and care about, and there really are only two, and that is um, information technology, my professional discipline, I hope you noticed my blouse. I don't know if you can see it, but it has all um, binary tape on it all, all the way. Um, but the, um, sorry, what was I going to say? Um, what was I saying? Um, well, I'm asking you about the charities and your philanthropic yeah. work and, and, and particularly how your background in IT has fed into that. Um, well, I've used um, virtual reality in training people to, with autism to find their ways around a city. Virtual reality is also used um, in the school that I'm um, associated with um, to um, make sure that children that are really um, traumatized by, by dogs is the usual one, um, can be helped to um, 
face their fears, um, see a dog on a screen, very, very small. A month later, it's a dog on a screen, quite large. A month later, it's a dog on a screen uh, being quite vicious. And we will gradually finish up where, where children are able to pet dogs and enjoy having, having a pet. Um, so we also use robots as teach, teaching robots, uh, which are extremely, um, they're about the size of a two-year-old child, so uh, appealing to adults and not threatening to children. And they teach basic nursery skills, um, look, listen, sit still, um, chestnut tree, um, all the nursery things that we do. The thing is that the robot does it over and over and over again. Never loses patience. It will do it yeah. over and over and over again. So it is a very effective um, teaching mechanism. And all pupils have um, lessons of, I think it's a couple of hours a week, uh, with using the robot or the robot helping them um, every week. So, I mean, would you say, and I think this is what you're saying, that in terms of kind of areas where AI is, is doing, you know, having amazing positive social impact, that the area of autism is a fantastic example of that, really? Well, I think it's a wonderful example. We're using really data science to really track what is happening to the children. I think we have 100,000 items of data a month um, for each child. Uh, in, in the school of, of 100 pupils. Um, so that's a fair amount of data and we're able to sort of say, um, Steve had um, a good breakfast, but she refused lunch. She was good in her uh, numerics class. She was um, failed on some of the visual tasks that she was doing and, and really be able to analyze what, what, what is going on in, in training. The aim of the, the, my school, which is for people, people with complex autism, many, many without speech, um, about 40% also with epilepsy, the two are very related. And, and this is a, a, a golden field, a mix of few metaphors, um, where information technology, can, artificial intelligence in particular, can, can, can really help in the future. Yeah, okay. About 700,000 um, people in Britain alone um, who have autism, some of um, so-called Asperger's um, who are highly intelligent but just see the world in a different place. I focus on uh, those like my own son um, who really are um, without speech. The correct term is pre-speech as if they were sometime going to start. And sometimes, actually, they do start to speak. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I, I, I want to come back to Bletchley Park, because I have to say, I was reading um, your latest book this morning, which, you know, is, is so full of um, interesting things and, and wonderful subtitles. Like one of the ones I love is why ambitious women have flat heads, but I don't think we've quite got um, time to go into that. But I mean, I was going to ask you about um, the significance of kind of recovering uh, women's role in coding, for example, at Bletchley Park. And then I see from your book that um, you are actually in the National Museum of Computing and, and you... I'm um, a museum piece. I know, and you crack a joke about being a museum piece. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I think Bletchley Park has been very important, hasn't it, for the recovery of, of women's roles to think that actually there's a long history of women's involvement in programming. I mean, I wonder if we could just sort of end with that. And I think it's so fitting that you're there and that you opened um, the exhibition there. Um, I think it is fitting. I, 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 I'm battling for women's empowerment uh, in this country and elsewhere uh, on and on and on. And while there's breath in my body, I shall go on doing it. Fantastic. Well, look, thank you so much. It's been just a pleasure meeting you and, a, and you know, and an honour to hear all these um, stories. And you've, you know, been absolutely a role model um, for me in my work and for lots of other people. So it's been a delight. Thank you very much.